Yeah, we missed Brian's... Because it was crocheted, and I think... What difference does that make? It was a new cast on, a new so is whatever. That, is that what people call it when they... No, I don't think oh. they do call it a cast on. Oh. I have no idea what do crocheters call lightning, because it's a long time since I even had to know what a verb was. Oh, decades. <laughs> decades. Decades and decades Literally and decades. is decades. All right. <laughs> that this competition... Oh, what, you're saying you can't include it because it's crochet? Outrageous. Is it a cast on? Underground, that overground, wombling, wombling free. free. The wombles of Wimbledon <laughs> come and on. Whatever the future may bring, support Henry completely. Now, one of those men was actually Walter Aspects. Dis- what was the cook called? Two sword. No, Madame Cholet. Madame Cholet, was it? So we're going to take a walk through... So we gonna. She's posy and purple. I'm not doing the voice. <laughs> she does a great voice. Welcome, everybody, to the Bakery Bears video show featuring my moving fingers. <laughs> What's it featuring? The next episode, the second episode of our brand new historical adventure series, England, a castle nation. Oh, it's wonderful. I've watched it and I loved it. Last time we started the series Mm -hmm. where we uncovered the story of where the castle came from. Yeah. Who invented it? Mm. How did it get here? This time, it's time to sort of properly get down to business and dig into what the series is all about. Yes, we're going to be visiting lots of castles and we're going to be learning about those castles and who built them. But we're also going to be focusing very much in on the Tudor period, running through yes. to the Stuart period and then finishing off with the Civil War. Mm. And it's such a cool mm. sort mm. of story. It really is. I loved it and I learned loads. That's so cool. <laughs> oh, I was it's, thrilled, to be honest, because... Yeah, yeah. I think that when you're close to a subject, I've read about this period of time for a long time. And what's been really fun is in researching this series, Mm. I've been able to get out a lot of books that I've had for years Mm. and Mm -hmm. sort of reread. And I don't know why, but to me it always sounds really posh when you're rereading a book. It depends on the book, doesn't it? Yeah, well, really? it, it, w- when you're talking about... When it's Winter Solstice yes, by yes. Rosamund Pilcher, it's not, not so muchly. Not so muchly. Oh, that's a new word. I like it. Not so... Not muchly. That sounds like something the, the Wombles word. would say. Not so highly intelligent. We were watching Michael Portilla the other day in a series that he made, I think in 2021. Uh, 2021. Where he's walking the south coast yeah. of England. And yeah. th- th- they, or he went to this spot where they were going out into the sea and they were trying to collect along the seafront. They were like fishermen. Oh, right, they were collecting the rubbish. They were collecting the rubbish. And it's such a great term that this guy who's sort of in charge of this project, because they all go off in in canoes so they can get to parts. To little coves where it all collects. And he said that they call them sea wombles. Sea wombles. (laughs) Because that's what the wombles did, didn't they, on Wimbledon Common? They collected... Uh, what what was the song? Uh, making good use of the things underground, that we found. Underground, overground, wombling free. free. The wombles <laughs> of Wimbledon come and are we? I love the wombles. Oh, it's all flooding back about the wombles. I used to love that. Oh, but I yeah, love the wombles too. Sea wombles. And the wombles to me. all of the rubbish. I'm convinced that the wombles are related to the flumps. No, the flumps are totally different. But they seem to live on a, like a rubbish heap as well. No, they don't. Oh, the right, flumps okay. didn't live... No, the the Wombles didn't live on a rubbish heap. They lived on Wimbledon Common. I know, I know, but it's just because they're with a rubbish link. But the flumps had nothing to do with it. I thought they lived on like a tip. The flumps? I don't think they lived on a tip. Look, it's going to be quite the episode because not only do we have the second episode of England of Castle Nation, also coming later on in the show, pattern launch. I have a pattern launch. Now that's an exciting show. Very exciting. Oh. Yeah, I've got a new sock design. A seasonal sock design. That I've just published. Oh. So we're going to be talking about that in what's off my needles. Oh, yes. Yep. It's going to be wonderful. Yep. And also, speaking of understanding things, we have been in a interesting situation recently because we've been trying to assist our daughter, Bryony, with her studies for her A-levels. Yeah. So we've been doing all sorts of things to try and sort of help her. Mm. We've been putting ourselves in interesting situations. For example, every evening we now play the grammar game. We do. And it's like, 
going back to school. It really is, yeah. So, I mean, Brian... Quite often she has to <laughs> teach us. She does. Well, she does all the time teach us. Brian is doing A-level English language of one of, one of her A-levels. And, you know, they really... One, one of the areas she's got to focus on is her grammar. And it's all of this sort of, like, verbs, adjectives, nouns. They're the basic ones. But then you have, like, adverbs, you have conjunctions, you have subordinate conjunctions, you have... Demonstratives. Demonstratives. Ooh, I love that you word. You have... Oh, there's all of these terms for different words. So Amazing. We've been helping her do that. Which so has it, been cool. Because yeah. what's been so exciting is... Finding all the time Bryony's been at school, we've been trying to find ways, and this is years, we've been trying to find ways to help. And we yeah. finally found a way to help yeah. because we've been doing this with her and there's been times where we've actually found stuff. She's like, oh, I don't know that. What's that? And then, you know, we've been able to sort of drill into it and yeah, it's and been we, great. Yeah, and we think by doing this every evening, just a little bit, you know, we spoke to a teachers about this, you know, just a little bit every evening and, it, you know, it's sinking in and we... we can't help but think that it'll be helpful when it comes to the sort of final exam, which is not long. Enough. So it's been so, very fun anyway. Yeah, we should Learning be, lots. Yeah, yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's like going back to school. It is, and it's quite frightening because it's a long time since I even had to know what a verb was. Oh, decades. <laughs> decades. Decades and decades Literally and decades. Decade. All right. <laughs> In a very delicate phase of a female's life, life where yes. you just feel completely old and washed up and done with. Speaking oh. speaking of old and washed up, I think it's time <laughs> that <laughs> we had a look mean? at some of my projects. I was going to say my projects are <laughs> old and washed up. <laughs> they're all old and washed know? up. So without further ado, I shall ask Kay Jones, what's on your needles? <laughs> So the first thing, and I'm going to remind you this time of new projects. Yeah, I've already added that one on. It was because it was crocheted. Yeah, we missed Brian's... Because it was crocheted. And I think... What difference does that make? It was a new cast on. A new so is whatever. That, is that what people call it when they... No, I don't think oh. they do call it a cast on. Oh. I have no idea. What do crocheters call something where they start it? Because we always think... say we've cast something on as knitters, don't we? Yes. I don't think there's really a term. So... I would strongly like to argue that this competition... Oh, what, you're saying you can't include it because it's crochet? Outrageous. Is it a cast-on? Let's let the no, audience... No, it's a new project. It's a new... Well, I oh, probably so did say a new cast-on. That is come what on. we've said since day one. Look, I'm going to throw my toys out the pram. Let's let the if audience you, if decide. If you won't include... No, everybody knows it's a new project. So we added that one. We have what added that one. What else can we include in cast-ons? Well, I don't, what do you mean? So, to be fair, sewing projects. No, I wouldn't include sewing projects. All oh, right, okay. Okay. Anyway. Oh, but I haven't done any sewing projects, so. Your anyway. project's making me feel hungry. Is it? Not oh. really. I find them a bit sickly. Yes. So, my, I agree. Okay. The first thing I'm going to show you is a new pair of socks, and this is a new cast-on. <laughs> So, this is a pair of socks for Bryony, and this is going to be an Easter present. So, I finished one sock, I'm on the second sock, and it will be done. I've, I'm doing my planning thing, and it'll be done for Easter, which is really early this year, isn't it? Easter Sunday, I think, is on the 30th of March. I think that's, I think that's when it is. So, this yarn is very special yarn. I very much enjoy watching Jeanette from Crafty Clegg's, right? Crafty Clegg's Creations, and... She's a, she makes bags. She's got an, I think it's an Etsy shop. I think it's an Etsy shop. And she sells handmade bags there. But occasionally, she also does self-striping yarn. And it's actually her husband that dyes the yarn. He's called Timothy. He features quite a lot in her podcast. I love him. Timothy? Timothy. I thought it was called Timothy. Timothy. <laughs> so, we can't, yeah, I love Jeanette. I love Jeanette, but I love her accent. Anybody who watches Jeanette understands what I'm saying. I just love listening to her. She could talk all day for me. So, yeah, she spoke a few weeks ago. She was dying... Oh, Timothy. Timothy was dying up some yarn. It's like she's here. <laughs> and it was Easter-themed. And let me tell you, he's done a brilliant job. So this yarn is based on a Cadbury's cream egg. Now, anybody who in this country knows what a Cadbury's cream egg, in, egg is, and I think it's probably a very well-known thing worldwide. But I don't know. 
But maybe Isn't it's not. Maybe it's not. But yeah, it's made by Cadbury's and it's basically a chocolate, a little chocolate egg about this big. And inside is like a fondant, which looks like yolk and the white of an egg. And it's just like a sweet fondanty substance. And I used to love these when I was younger. I used to, um, I used to treat it like a proper little boiled egg, and I would chop the top off. Everybody did that, Kate. Did they? Yes. Everyone also got the the, the egg cup. Yes. Stuck it, yes. Yes. I put it on an egg cup, just like you did on your boiled egg in the yeah, morning. Yeah, yeah. And got I, a chopped, spoon. I chopped the top yeah. off with a knife, yes. and then I spooned out. Did everybody do that? Well, some people even tried dipping toast into it. Oh no! That's yes. Disgusting. Yes, I, I did. You did that. I did. That's I did. Disgusting. <laughs> but anyway. When I saw this, he was doing this yarn based on Cadbury's cream eggs, I was, and she showed a little swatch that she'd done. I was like, I've got to try and get some of that yarn because it, it, it's just her and Timothy. They don't, you know, do very much of it. And I thought, oh, I'll never get any. Anyway, I managed to get it. And I think that was probably because she's in the UK and I'm in the UK. So the time that she did the update suited me as well. Quite often I miss updates because they're in the States, for example. And for me, it'll be like the middle of the night and I just can't get any. But this worked brilliantly. So, yeah, this yarn was called Dream Egg. How do you knit yours? And that's the little tag that came with it. With needles and a pan, Jeanette. <laughs> And there's 400 metres, it's a 75-25 fingering weight. So here it is in the cake. So you can see it's got all of the colours of a Cadbury's cream egg wrapper. It's that kind of purplish bluish colour, red, a little bit of yellow and a little bit of white. And I've knit the first sock, I'm going to show you that in a second. But first of all, I just want to say this yarn base, it says 75-25 but it's a bit on the rustic side. It's not the 7525 that's very commonly dyed by dyers. It is a bit more rustic and, you know, it's not, it's not terribly scratchy, but there is a tiny bit of a prickle. And when I first started knitting these, I thought, oh, I don't know if Bryony's gonna be okay with this because she's she does like, you know, soft sock yarn. But I knit the leg and then I got her to just slip it onto her foot and I left it there for a bit. And she's like, oh, it's all right. So it got the approval of Bryony and that was okay. I think the approval was gained because of what the she, yarn is. She really wants the socks. Yeah. But she was all right wearing them. And I've washed this one and... You know, it feels fine, but it definitely isn't that base that we're all very familiar with. It is a little bit more rustic. But yeah, here's the first sock. Oh, isn't it cool? So you get these stripes of the sort of thick stripes of the bluish purplish, sort of the Cadbury's purple, if you like. And would you say it's purple or blue? You know, the Cadbury's colour. Blue. Do you think it's blue? Be purple. It's definitely got purple in it, I think. So yeah, you get the thicker stripes of the blue and the red, and then you get these little hints of the yellow and the white. And I think it just looks fantastic. So I've added a chocolate brown. It's gotta be chocolate brown, hasn't it? A chocolate brown for the heel and the toe. And I've used my fairground pattern, which just works brilliantly well. So this heel that I've used is my butterfly heel. And this is in the fairground sock pattern. There are two heel options in that. There's the, the butterfly heel, which is a mock short row heel. It's knit flat. It's knit as you work the sock. So it's not an afterthought heel. You knit the leg, you then work the heel over half of the stitches. It's worked back and forth. And then you carry on down the foot. So I really love this heel because I don't particularly like what, doing short rows. I've never been a, sh a fan of, of doing short rows. I've tried all of the methods and I'm just not keen on it. Um, so when I found this sort of technique of doing a mock short row heel, that really works for me. And it looks very, very similar. If I show you up close, it looks very, very similar to a short row heel. And then I've done a umbrella toe. So that's in the pattern as well. So in the fairground socks, there's this heel and then there's also just a standard slip stitch heel as well. So you've got two options. And it doesn't it work brilliantly well with this yarn? I think it just looks fantastic. So I've given this one a little soak and a block because I wanted to see what the yarn was like. 
and it's perfect I think it will wear really well I will say that I think it will wear really well because it is that little bit more rusty and I've got the second one on the needles so I've done the cuff and I've just started working on the leg I did forget when I started these socks that normally with fairground socks I would do a contrast cuff as well and I totally forgot in my excitement to just start knitting this yarn and just to try it but I think it's fine I don't think I've done a fairground sock pattern before where I've not done a contrast cuff and I think it looks I think it looks lovely and this this pattern gosh how many times have I knit this pattern now it's Bryony's favorite she tells me all the time she'll go these are my favorite mum and it'll be a pair of fairground socks her very favorite is the pair that's actually the main photo for the pattern it's a yarn from fab funky fibers and i'm actually going to be showing you a yarn from her later because i bought another skein that one's her favorite although i think now she's got maybe five pairs i don't even know but i don't i just absolutely do not get bored of knitting this pattern at all it's just one of those designs that i could just knit all the time and obviously i do and it just works so well for self-striping. I, I can't think, personally, you know, I think it's my very favourite for self-striping. Absolutely love it. So we've got one sock finished and I've got the other one on the go and it will be done for Easter. I cast these on. I think I've I found it really interesting to see how, how long it takes me to knit socks. And I cast this pair on on the 25th of February. I finished the first sock on the 11th of March and then I cast on the second one on the 12th of March. And it'll be done by, well, before Easter. It'll be done towards the end of March. I've sort of planned it out to make sure that it will be done for then. So, so how long will that will have taken me? About a month. And that seems to be about my average just from tracking the sort of last few pairs that I've been making and I think ordinarily it would take me longer than that but because I've been keeping a note of it and I've been using a system where I'm just knitting a little bit every day I find that I'm getting through them much quicker and even for Dan's socks which I'm going to show you a pair later I got those done in a month and they're huge so it really works for me using this system and I, I find it just really satisfying just to do that little bit every day it's not overwhelming and I certainly get through more breaking it down like that so yeah I'm knitting these magic loop I have knit fairground socks both ways I've knit them double points and magic loop I don't use the short circulars but I know when I went through the testing I'm sure one of my testers used a short circular for hers so yeah, brilliant for whatever method, I think. But these are two and a half millimetre because Bryony likes her socks not too sucky in. She likes them a little bit more relaxed, I suppose. Yeah, and I'm like that as well. And I think you're like that too. I mean, do you, or do you like sucky in socks? I like them to fit. I think inevitably I yours always... I don't always... like them baggy. No, but inevitably yours always end up a bit more sucky in because your feet are so big. I like them tighter. Yeah, you yeah. you would you like them tighter than me and Brian, yeah. Yeah, which is the reason why I like the ribbed ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they yeah, they fit better, yeah. So yeah, that's my cream egg socks on the go. So anyone else who managed to get a skein of this yarn, if you haven't cast it on yet, I we I really I really would recommend you do because it's super fun to knit and I'm just really enjoying you know seeing all of these lovely stripes it's very seasonal and you know I want to get these done really for Easter because that's the season of cream eggs for me isn't it even though they are too sickly sweet for me these days well I don't eat chocolate but from memory they are too sickly sweet and you don't really like them either do you these days no all um, this talk of chocolate would you like a little bit of chocolate history okay do you know where chocolate came from uh, the Aztecs, well, or was it the Incas? Yes, no, 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 no. It, it came out of Mexico. It was oh. being transported by the Spanish in the 17th century. Oh, right, OK. They they sort of got hold of it, and that's obviously when there was lots going on between the English and the Spanish trying to be dominant at sea. Uh. So quite often there'd be, 
you know, English ships fighting with Spanish ships, if they caught the Spanish ship, they catch the Spanish ship and they take it as their prize, right. they'd find these strange beans oh, right. down in the cargo hold and nine times out of ten they threw them overboard. Uh. They didn't realise that at the time they were nearly as valuable as gold. Right. The beans were. And yeah. initially, chocolate was drunk. It wasn't. Yes, I know. Well, and that, that's, I, that's why I said I think it came from... That kind of yeah. area. And because they drank it as like a, I suppose, hot chocolate it'll be, wouldn't it? But not in the form that we... No, because it wasn't sweet. No. And they also thought it was healthy. Well, it, I think it kind of is so, in, that, in that format. So what happened was it starts to spread across Europe. And as it's spreading across Europe, it's becoming more and more popular and more and more people are partaking right. because they think it's a healthy alternative to drinking tea or coffee. Right. And also people would have it for breakfast. Right. And it wasn't until really quite late that it got turned into a bar. And I can tell you the first person to ever make a chocolate bar. Okay. You would never guess. It was fries. Oh. And it was right. made as like a, you know, like a healthy, like, like I get those protein bars yeah, it was yeah, made yeah. like that right and it was from there and the reason why england became like the 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 chocolate capital of the world for a certain amount of time we were we pioneered yeah the, the, York, the chocolate bar it was a big chocolate it, it was and also place wasn't it bourneville yeah so dan jones yes what's on your needles after my chocolate tangent it was wasn't it it's the goadie it's my let lopey jumper it's the what the goadie oh is that what it's called yeah yeah oh. And I've knitted through the, the base of the jumper. The, the, the base? Yeah, what do you call it? The, the base bottom. of the jumper. Yeah, the base, the bottom. The the, the, the ribbing, you mean? Well, more than that, the above the ribbing. The base of the jumper. Yeah. Okay, you've done the ribbing and you're on the body. I've, I've done the floor <laughs> colour work. Oh, the basement colour work. So the colour work at the bottom of the jumper has been completed. And... It's lovely. I mean, look at that. It is lovely. It's sitting beautifully. Mm. It really does just... Oh, look at that. I know, isn't it great? You, What did you say it looked like? Mountains. It looks like mountains, doesn't it? The colours. It's like this bit, you know, the bottom bit of the mountains in deep shadow. And then you, as you move up, you see the green of the sort of... Say it's like a conifers. And then the sun is sort of glinting on the top bit. And the yarn, of course, is the Let Lopey. These mm. are the colours that I'm using, and they look absolutely gorgeous, don't they? They are they a bit do. like steel wool. Well, it is, <laughs> isn't it, Let Lopey? Um, I swapped out just one of the colours. The Apart from the green that you can see, that sort of sagey green, all of the other colours were from the pattern. Yeah. But that sagey green that you can see should have been a brown. And I just swapped it for the green because I just thought that looked prettier. Definitely. But isn't it? The colours are just gorgeous. They look really, really lovely. It's such a this fascinating... Is, this is for you, isn't it, of course? Yeah. yeah. No, I think the colour will look good on you. you oh, said that, well. You said that with a due sense of... The colours will look really nice on or, or, you. Or were you being... What? No, were you being I, diplomatic? No, I was, were you hoping panicking? It, I hope, I was hoping you weren't going to say it was for me. No, it's for me. I, I can't it's wear... It's all mine, Kay. It's all mine. I can't mine. wear it on my arms and things. No, no, that's the reason why <laughs> yours is the Aaron Harpaganzi and the yeah. lovely soft Jameson and Smith. Yeah, yeah. And mine's the... Oh, it's lovely, isn't now, it? Now, it's been so cold recently, that we, which is lovely. Normally, I could wear my Let Lopey sort of mid-November through into January, but I actually had one on mm. since I last saw you. Yeah, yeah And it was marvellous. Yeah, yeah. And I'm really going to start paying attention more to the weather because you sort of sometimes, I think we all fall into this trap, you dress to the month rather than to ha how it actually feels. And what I found is if it is under 10 degrees... C. And if it is a little bit windy... Mm then I can wear one no problem. As soon as it gets mm -hmm. properly under sort of five degrees, four degrees, I can wear one whether it's windy or not. Mm. And the more I can wear these, the better, to be honest, because there's no, the, it feels like it's part of you when you're out walking. I right. just love it. Mm. And you like knitting it as well, don't you? It is. It's hilarious. We, we were messing around with the yarns the other day, and the way that they were sticking, you were like, oh, my goodness. Cause like, it, well, that's why it's so good for colour work, because yeah. it's such a sticky yarn. 
but it's just hilarious when you are like working with it in a bag because you'll pull it out and it literally is all like stuck to each mm, other mm, it's a fascinating mm. substance i find it really sort of full of character i think that's it, what it is, is you know yeah. and it's very suited to the country it comes from you know it's Icelandic. i want to meet some of the sheep it's icelandic if you didn't know lopi yarn is icelandic and you know lopi sheep i think they just stay out all year i think mm. you know and obviously iceland gets incredibly cold in the winter gorgeous so Beautiful. loving my jumper and oh, now on the body and really enjoy it it's the only so it's just yarn. lots of round and round knitting oh, now isn't it i don't have an issue with that when it's interesting yarn knitting right. up a lovely fabric right what else is on your hands? right so this next project right has come out of hibernation it's been in hibernation for over a year to be honest, it's been taunting me up there in its project bag. I haven't wanted to work on it, so I just gave it some thought as to what I wanted to do about it, and I came up with a solution. It might not be the solution that is the most exciting to people, maybe, <laughs> but it's the solution that I've come up with just to get it off the needles and get it out of the project bag up there. So this is the cardigan that you you may remember you may not i cast this on i think about two years ago now because at the time i just had a hankering to see whether i could design myself a cardigan and i i did design it and i i you know i've been knitting it for a while and then i got to the point of making it look a bit more like a cardigan because at the time it was just a piece of fabric and then I got to the point of separating off and working up the first front and it was at that point that I kind of lost interest with it because it, it became a garment then it became like you know this is going to be a cardigan and I just I don't know I don't know what it is about me and garments you know I can knit them I have knit them but I just don't really enjoy the process of knitting them. So this got stuck in a bag and it's been in a bag up there for like over a year. I had a long think about it and I thought, well, I don't want to rip out all of this work that I've done. The stitch pattern is beautiful. The fabric looks lovely. So what can I do? So what I've decided to do, so here is the piece of fabric, let's say, because it's no longer a cardigan. So what I was doing originally was this was going to be the, it's the body and the two fronts all as one piece. And then my idea was to separate off, work up the front and then do the back and then do the other front and then join the shoulders and then work down for the sleeves, pick up and work down for the sleeves. I was just doing a very basic drop shoulder, really simple shape of a cardigan. The front is no longer there. <laughs> So what I did was I pulled out that front and I got back to having all of the stitches on the needle. And you might be able to tell now, but what I'm doing is I'm working another garter border here. And I'm going to put the buttons on, because I've got the buttons, I'll show you those in a second. I'm going to put the buttons on here, button it up, and it's going to become a cowl. So it'll be a nice wide, I think quite long. I might be able to wrap it twice, but more likely it'll just be like a nice loose cowl that will just go once around my neck, if you like. So when I was thinking about this, you know, part of me was thinking I'm just going to have to force myself and push through and finish this cardigan because I know through through the, over the last sort of year when this hasn't been shown and I haven't spoke about it I have had the odd message from people saying oh what's happening with your cardigan I'd love to see it I'd love to see the progress and I just felt really bad I just felt really guilty that this is not now going to become a cardigan and I I'm just like oh people are going to say oh what a shame and oh you should have carried on and all of these kind of comments and that just makes me feel really bad but at the end of the day I've, I've got to do something with this. There's no point in it just sat up there in the bag, is there? No point at all. The yarn's lovely. Let me show you what the yarn is, because it is a long time. I think the, 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 the crux to it, and it's quite simple. Were you enjoying knitting a cardigan? No. Are you enjoying knitting this? 
Yeah, so, you know, because so, I, so what? What, I know, what about that is is sad and disappointing? Well, it's not for me. It's not. Well, it's not it sad it and shouldn't disappointing be for anybody for else me. either. I guess I'm just nervous about what people are going to say, and I shouldn't be. Should I? That's just well, no, because you know, it's just silly. The fact is, um, you weren't enjoying this the cardigan. No, and I, you are I, enjoying it in the cowl. And I love. And it's as simple I, as that. I love the fabric, and the thing about this yarn, I've still got the swatch in here. And I blocked this swatch two years ago and it still looks beautiful. It's just been screwed up in the bag. But look at the swatch. It's so pretty. So I know that this is going to block just gorgeously and it'll be lovely to wear. But the yarn is from BC Garn and it's called Samilla. And I think it's sold as a DK weight. It's not, it's not DK. It's, you get, they come in 50 gram balls. It's 100% wool. I'm not sure what sort of wool. It's, I don't think it's, is it superwash? Oh, it, well, it, it's showing 30 degrees, but I, I wouldn't put this in the washing machine, but it might be superwash. It's organic wool. You get 160 meters for 50 grams. That's not a DK, is it? I don't think it is. It's more like a sport weight or a heavy, heavy fingering even. I'm knitting this on, I'm pretty sure it's 3.25 millimetres. It recommends between three and four millimetre. So I'm in that sort of zone, aren't I? And the, I can't remember the colourway name. It says F11P1025. And I've obviously got tons of this left. So I'm gonna think of something else that I can make with this. Maybe I'll double it and do something else with it. I'm not sure. Because it's, it's beautiful yarn. It really is gorgeous yarn. I'm at the stage now where I... It took a bit of time, to be honest, ripping back what I'd done and getting it back on the needles. And then I, I worked a bit more of the pattern because I wanted it to end at the right point so that it looked symmetrical top and bottom. And... I've got one more buttonhole that I'm going to put in at the end here because there, how many buttonholes have I got? One, two, three, one, two, three, four. There'll be five buttonholes down the side. And at first I thought I'll seam it together along this edge here. But I'm just going to see what it's like because I thought I could just put the buttons on and button it and I think it'll be all right. But the buttons that I've got, oh no, they've come out of their little case. Hang on. I found these, they were in an online shop somewhere in Europe, I forget now, it's that long ago since I, I got them, but they are Swarovski crystals and I wanted a colour that would sort of match the yarn. So these are the buttons, can you see how they glint? Aren't they lovely? And they've got that, I don't know what sort of fixing it's called, but it's just got like a channel on the back there where you thread your yarn through and it's solid on the front. And I've got loads of these, so I've got plenty. And they match. I wanted them to not stand out from the yarn. You can see they re look really good and they'll just add a bit of bling to it. So yeah, all I've got to do to finish this off now is do that top garter border. I think there's about, I did 10 garter ridges at the bottom so I'm going to do 10 at the top and I've done two garter ridges already so that means I've got 16 more rows to knit they're really long rows I can't remember my cast on number I'll have to look back in my notes it doesn't really matter now does it but yeah I'm just going to work my way through that border I'm going to bind off I'm going to um, give it a block because I think it'll be beautiful when it's had a soak and a stretch out I say stretch out, I never overly block anything. I don't like um, heavily blocking things because I think all you're doing is you're just stretching the yarn to its limits. So I I don't really like heavily blocking. I mean, this, this one, the swatch, all I did was I soaked it and then I just laid it flat on, you know, on, I know a lot of people use those mats, don't they? Those sort of play mat things but I just stretched it out on a towel, I'd not stretched it out, I just laid it flat and I just sort of smoothed the lace out and then I just put a few pins either corner, you know, on each of the corners and that's it really. So I don't, I don't like overstretching yarn. So yeah, this, I'm calling it my cardigan cowl. Well, 
will shortly be finished. It'll be something useful because I think the colour will be lovely around my neck. And, you know, I've got loads of this yarn. So I could make a hat, I could make mitts, and I could have a whole, a whole little ensemble, couldn't I, in this yarn? Because it is gorgeous. It's not scratchy at all. It's really, really lovely. I mean, I'll see how much yarn I've got left and potentially what I could make with it. Yeah, so that's a positive, isn't it? That I've got loads of the yarn left and I can just have a think about what I want to do with it. So that's my cardigan cowl. The correct is you're just not a garment knitter. I'm just not a garment knitter and I have huge guilt. So. I have huge guilt about that. It, how stupid is this? You know, because I see all of these people knitting all of these beautiful garments and, you know, you know, oh, I've knit another jumper, I've knit another cardigan and they're amazing. I'm like, oh, I don't do that. And I could. You should maybe move out then. I'm, I'm perfectly capable of doing it. But at the end of the day, just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to do that thing, does it? No, it, it, it doesn't. And also, though, it's in your personality to be guilty about everything. Yes, that's true. So the reason why is probably just because of that. It's my life's work. So it, it's it's more, it'll be more that than anything else, I would guess. I would guess. It's your natural yeah. disposition. And, but, you know, perhaps there is an aura which a garment knitters put across that they're better than you. I don't, well... I know I think that. You... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's so I, I don't get that If bad. ever there was an example of that garment knitters aren't better than you, this is it. I enjoy your sarcasm, darling. No, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. I am... You know, I will no, never I don't be... Think... Close to even, I guess I'm not fit to clean the underside of your shoes, <laughs> never mind the top of them. We don't do either, so, no, you know. It is a metaphor. The metaphor is, I will never be as good as you are unless you stopped knitting and I carried on and I started to like catch you up because you're always pushing further and further on. We're going like this, and you, that's how it should be. My point is, garment knitters you, are not better than. No, Sock knitters. No, that is true, but I think the sometimes I, I make myself feel like I'm not in the same league as and all, I all long, these people. And that I along with, I'm sure, all, these all amazing the rest of the audience. Is, each anyway, to their own. You're at not the end a garment day, knitter, no. and that's fine. That's that. I'm going to stick with my socks and accessories and everything else. And blankets. Blankets. And all the many and, other things. Yes. You've knitted many garments in your time. The, the one that my mum loves and I have you know, knit garments I have for me many many of them for me yeah and, yeah you've you got know the list goes two on and on or three fests so you know that's the end of that yes look at my lovely Sherwood socks isn't the yarn amazing it's the beautiful. green makes me think of Sherwood Forest can I have the leftovers please Robin Hood Robin Hood riding through the glen you know I like leftovers Robin Hood Robin Hood with his band of men with his merry men isn't it uh, is it band of men with his band of men oh Right, yeah, okay. robs from the rich. No, st no, steals from the poor. No, he gives doesn't to the steal. Rich. No, 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 you've totally got it confused. I'm going yeah. to pop this one I've on got the block. That all right? confused. Yes, it's my Sherwood sock. Kay designed these for me. I love these socks immensely. I've enjoyed these last two pairs of socks that I've knitted so much. You've knit these before as well. Yeah, I you? have, and I'm now going to do after I've done this because isn't there one of the Squirrely ones or something that is very similar to this. Finished, very nearly finished. Look. Okay. What? Isn't one of the squirrely? Squirrely ones. Squirrel nutkin or something. A, a squir <laughs> Have you not knit the nutkin? Oh, that's very difficult to isn't say. Isn't there? Isn't there a pair of socks? Have that, you not knit the nutkin socks? Have you designed another pair of socks that are in similar construction to? The Whispers in the Walls and the Sherwood socks. I think the nutkin ones. I was right. Have you knit those? I think I have. Oh, so you don't want to knit them again? I do, because I've knitted these before. Right, okay. Yes. Right. Yes, I, I'm into rereading books. I'm into re-knitting patterns. Well, we'll have to go through all my patterns and see, because you, you don't like patterns that are like an all-over sort of repeating. No, I just pattern. like a bit of interest. But I must tell you, it's ladies and gentlemen, insulting. I've made a massive discovery, and I need to share it with you. What type of needles are these? Ah. Oh. What type of needles are these? These are chow goo. And any particular model? Any particular model? Yeah, like, yeah. What, like a Ford Escort RS5? Yeah, these RX are the Jagu Ford Escort RS5. <laughs> That's it's a funny name for Jagu needles Wasn't anyway. is that a car? Oh, it's not the needles. Oh, sorry. What is it? What are they? 
They're just chowky double points, metal. If you've not tried them. I don't think they have. If you've not tried these any. needles, you totally should. Okay, you should give them a go. Oh. I think you'd love these needles. Oh. Huge discovery. I just... The, the, if you recall, last time I was using the Cubics. Yes. The Cubics were way too slippy. Nipro Cubics. Nipro Cubics. was too slippy. Nipro Cubics, perfect for bigger, but on this small size, two and a half mil, aren't they? Yes. Two and a half mil. They're just too, it's too challenging. If you were like the tightest knitter in the history of the world, yeah. maybe you'd be okay. Yeah. But unfortunately not. Tried the collage. Awful. Yes. Well, yeah. Awful. Well, yeah, it's funny. We, if you were the loosest knitter in the world, they those, might be great for those, you. They're knit collage, I think they're called. Yes. And they had the potential, and they're, they're square, like the Knit Pro are, cute, like the Cubics. And they had the potential to be really good. But you just really didn't care for them. And they've got a really strange texture. They're rough. They're, they're sort of... They've sort of obviously got like a coating on them, and I I had a little nip with them just to try, and I found it a bit like chalk on a chalkboard. Yes, yeah, like But again, if if you were a super, wouldn't it be a super loose knit? Super, super loose, loose knitter. knitter. If you're constantly dropping your stitches because you're a really loose knitter, yeah. these the, the, the collage needles they grip onto your stitches. Yeah, they are really grippy. Really grip on. And they had lovely points. The tips were really nice. A bit awkward for doing cables, though. Was it? It was the cables where it all came unstuck. Oh, right. Nice for lace, though. Maybe. Good for lace. Maybe. Yeah. But, yeah, the, so I said to Dan, look, I'm just going to go and get you one of my pairs of chow goos. Because I love... Brilliant. I love chow goo double points. Such a discovery. The, the metal ones. I told Kay all about them, and she's going to try them, too. Do you know... I ha- you must all look and think, how on earth does she live with that man? And, you know, you'd be right. But they're lovely. I've used these loads. So I dug him out a pair of my two and a half millimetres, gave them to him. He's like, these are really nice. I said, yeah, well, I've been telling you to use those for, like, how long? Well, I did use them. And then I moved on to the... The square. The, the, the but square I ones. think the problem is your tension has loosened a little bit. Not hugely, but I think it's just a normal tension now. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's possibly what's caused... So, great yarn, great project. I want the leftovers. Great DPNs, we're rocking. Look at that green. I dyed this up a while ago. Oh, I want the leftovers, please. (laughs) What else is on your needles? Right. The last thing I've got to show you is Bryony's scarf. I've been working a little bit on this every day. Well, I missed two days, actually, because... I was in a bit of a design thing and I was just using every bit of my time to work on a particular design. So I did miss a couple of days on it, but generally I've been doing a row on this every day. So this is where I'm up to with Bryony's crochet scarf. And I just love it. So I've done, I think, 24 or 25 rows now. I forget, it's something around there. So this is just a basic granny stripe scarf and I'm crocheting it length lengthwise so I chained 344 I'm using the attic 24 free instructional sort of pattern that's on Lucy Lucy of attic 24 it's on her blog I think everybody knows this pattern don't they I've done it several times so I'm just using that basic pattern and in that pattern you've got to chain a multiple of three plus two. What I did was I thought right I'm just going to chain 300 and see how long that is. So I did that and then I just kept adding a bit in you know multiples of three until I thought it was long enough and then I just added the extra two and that brought me to 344. So I think this is about, when I measured it, it's round about 68, 70 centimetres, centimetres, inches. It's round about 68 to 70 inches long. And I think last time I said that 68 was my height. It's not, because that's 5 foot 8, isn't it? 68 inches. I'm not 5 foot 8. (laughs) I'm 5 foot 6. So I was wrong in that. But it's Bryony's height, although she's 5 foot 9. Look. I don't need to talk any more about height, do I? So yeah, I'm using all the greens. Bryony wanted a scarf which was in all the greens. 
So I pulled out loads of minis from my stash and, and leftovers as well, but they were all 20 grams. And I, I pulled out 24. And then Bryony said she wanted dark light, dark light, dark light. And I thought that would work through all the 24 minis, but I got to a point where I didn't have any of the dark colors left. I had loads of lighter shades, but not enough dark colors. So I'm working with less than 24. What have I got? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. I've got 18 colors in there. And I'm just repeating through now. So I think I've done one, two, three, four, five. I'm on my sixth yarn that's been repeated, if you get me. And I think it just looks lovely. So it's gonna be nice and long. It's quite funky looking, isn't it? I think it's gonna be really cool when she's wearing it. I think she'll really like it. And I think it's just nice for a change to have a crochet scarf instead of knitted. She's got loads of knitted scarves from me but no crochet scarf. So at the ends here, you can see that I left all of the ends dangling on both ends. So I'm just doing one row of each color. So I just do one row, I um, cut the yarn, leaving a long tail. I then pick up my next yarn, I leave a long tail and just start knitting that row and then it leaves all of these tails. So there's two benefits of this. One is that you don't have any tails to weave in, bonus. And then the other is that it's gonna create a fringe of sorts. I don't know how thick of a fringe it's going to be, but it'll be doubled over because this is gonna be doubled. So what I will do is I'm gonna work it, I almost said knit, I'm gonna crochet it to twice the width that I want for the scarf and then it'll be folded in half lengthwise and then I'm, I'm going to either seam or crochet down the long edge to seam it together and it'll be about I, I looked at our other scarves and they tend to be somewhere between eight and nine inches wide so I'm going to crochet to double that fold it in half seam it together and I think it'll be lovely so I'm, no, I'm not in any rush to get this done. I'm just doing that one row every day and it'll be finished when it's finished. But I think it's just a nice way of just doing a little bit of crochet without doing myself any damage because it's I have a dodgy shoulder with crochet and I can't do too much of it. But I'm finding one row, not fast, because I do have a habit of going quite fast with crochet. One row, not too fast a day and it's working out. Beautiful. Yeah, so that's fun. Right! Last month, we debuted our brand new historical adventure series, England, a Castle Nation. Yes. And in the first episode, we established how the castle arrived in England. Today, it's time to get down to business. Picture the scene. It's Tudor England. We are a Castle Nation. And with the arrival of King Henry VIII, castles are about to take on a whole new importance. This is England, a Castle Nation. Have you ever thought how the world we live in today came to be? Why do so many of us live in houses made from bricks? How do most of us end up in a supermarket every week? How did some of us get the surnames we have? And why even do many modern day jobs exist? The thing I love the most about history is we can get the answers to all this and so much more. It's always fascinated me when I've looked back through time to try and identify the things which relate to you and me today. And in this series, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try and marry the ancient with the modern. We're going to take a look at the end of the ancient world, a world that our ancestors knew so well and we're gonna tell the story of how it all started to change and become the modern world that you and I live in today.
1,000 years ago, that is what the majority of England looked like. The houses we lived in were simple wooden structures, and the lives that most of us led were rustic and hard, to say the least. But a change was on the horizon. Technological innovation from the continent was about to burst onto the scene that would completely transform the lives of all of us. The dawn of the castle had come, and in this series, we're going to tell its story. Where did these gigantic structures come from? Why were they invented? And why were so many built so quickly? And then it gets really interesting, because how did this medieval structure, reminiscent of the buildings of ancient Rome, come to inspire completely the towns and cities of England, from the houses we live in to the shops we buy from? Along the way, we're gonna tell the story of the kings and queens who unsuspectingly ushered in this change. A change that would lead us on a path to something completely unexpected, to civil war and a republic. This is a truly epic tale that I can't wait to tell you. Welcome to England, a castle nation. everyone to England, a castle nation, after our first episode where we discovered the story of the arrival of the castle in England. I'm so excited to be here today beginning the series properly as we visit our first main destination of the series. We've come to one of my favourite castles actually in, in all of England, all the ones I've ever visited. It's one I used to come to a lot when I was a child and it's just spectacular because it's positioned in the North York Moors National Park. This, this castle right here, this was once the home to Walter Esbeck. He was a Norman nobleman who arrived with William the Conqueror. And today, this place, Helmsley Castle, is very much the southern gateway to the North York Moors National Park. And what a castle Walter Esbeck built. Instead of constructing a Motton Bailey like we saw in episode one, here at Helmsley, a great outer ditch surrounded a double baileyed castle, which we'll discover more about later on in the show. As we discovered last time, the castle arrived with the Normans. And over the next 470 years, hundreds of them were built. England had become a castle nation. And wherever a castle was built, a monastery followed, like this one, just three miles from Helmsley and paid for by the man who built the castle. This is Revo Abbey. By 1538, it had become one of the biggest and most successful Cistercian monasteries in Europe. But none of that mattered to Henry VIII, perhaps the most famous Tudor monarch of them all. 
hundreds of years, the population of the country had been governed by the castles and the monasteries of England. The centre of most people's world was their local monastery. They fed the poor, cared for the sick, educated the young, and if you are lucky, provided spiritual guidance in what was an often terrifying world. So you can imagine the shockwaves when Henry shut every one of the monasteries. On top of that, the population of England had to cope with the fact that the religion which they'd known for so long was now gone. The Pope and Catholicism was out and the new Church of England was in. In today's episode, we're going to start to discover the story of those first turbulent years as the monasteries closed and that new life began. I'm sure to the men and women who work these fields, it would have felt like their whole world had been turned upside down. Because whilst they dealt with all that, it seemed like every other minute they were welcoming a new Queen of England. Whilst Henry VIII had been married to his first Queen, Catherine of Aragon, for 24 years, he would run through his next five wives in just 10 years. That is very much the story that we're gonna tell over the next two episodes because at the very centre of that story, its beating heart in this part of the country, is Helmsley Castle. And when Revo Abbey closed, Helmsley Castle was already 418 years old. So before we get going with our tales of Tudor intrigue, why don't you head off to the castle and find out a little bit more about it. So this is it. We've made it into the heart of the estates of Walter Espec. Now Walter was one of the most important men in the Middle Ages. He was just a huge, a towering and prominent military figure in early England history. He'd actually grown to prominence in the reign of William the Conqueror's son, King Henry I, and he'd acquired Helmsley in 1120. And whilst it's thought that there was probably something here before Walter started building, nothing has ever been found archeologically. So this could be it. When Walter broke ground, perhaps that was the start of Helmsley as we know it today. Now, Walter was building at a really brilliant time because castles had arrived in 1066 and in the ensuing few decades, people had constantly been pushing the boundaries to try and improve on that original Motton Bailey design. Helmsley is absolutely no different. Just take a look at it from the air. As castle technology had developed, it became clear that layers of defences were superb at keeping people out. So as you can see below, there's no one mound of earth with a tower plonked on top of it. At Helmsley, there are layers of defences. An outer walled bailey would have formed the first line of defence. Much of the walls have disappeared, but you can see the earthen mound where it once stood proud here. Two ditches protected the main castle buildings here and here. Sitting between those ditches, we find the castle's main entrance, protected by a huge stone fortification. You'll find these in many medieval defence systems. It's called a barbican. After crossing a bridge, we then reach the south gate before finally making our way into the inner bailey where all the buildings the castle required to operate were situated. You can absolutely see how formidable this outer ditch was because it is just vast, the the mound on my right hand side and the engineers who constructed this knew exactly what they were doing because all the earth that they took from here to create this ditch, they used to make the mound that the castle at the inner bailey and the outer bailey were constructed on. And at certain points along this ditch, they had to actually quarry out stone 
perfect because the stone that they quarried, they then used to build the castle that sits on top of what is in effect the mot. As we leave that fantastic ditch behind, I think that I should probably mention, because I bet there's a few of you that might be wondering, did that ever hold water? Well, there's no evidence that it did at all. There has been some evidence found of one ditch holding some water on the northern side of the castle, but I suspect that probably had an awful lot more to do with the castle's kitchens wanting to keep some fish. So the ditches themselves were the defence, and as we've seen walking through them, I think they were a pretty good defence. Now, the weak point of any castle is its main entrance. And in the years following the building of Richmond, an innovation had been developed that had transformed the safety of all castles. And that was the Barbican. Ahead of us lies a reconstruction of what the Barbican once looked like. Its sole purpose was to protect the main entrance to the castle. It filtered all potential invaders through a choke point where the castle's defenders all occupied the high ground, making it virtually impossible to get in. It's thought French crusaders had first discovered Barbicans in the walled cities of the east. They had been developed there to keep out war elephants. When we think of a castle, there's a few things that we think of, aren't there? The first is a moat, and I'm sorry that Helmsley doesn't have one, but what it does have is a drawbridge. Yes, synonymous with all castles. I remember having one myself made for me actually by a friend of my dad's. He made me this amazing castle with a drawbridge, had a barbican as well that you could add on the outside, all made of wood. It was superb. Here, it is of course made of stone. Apart from the mechanism which enabled that drawbridge to be either pulled up or dropped down if it was a friend or foe. And I'm told that up here in the outer gateway of the Barbican, you can see, and you can, it's right there, you can see the holes that the wooden levers and ropes used to come through that would pull up or drop down that drawbridge. Let's have a look. Here we go, look at this. Do you see the square and rectangular holes up there? They run up to a second floor, which is where the system would have been operated from. If you were a friend, down it would come to let you in. If you were not, you were most definitely stuck outside. Thankfully, the drawbridge has been dropped. We are a friend and we've been allowed into the castle. Now though, we have another huge gateway to get through. And before that, there's an even bigger ditch, the inner ditch, which is even deeper than the one that we saw earlier. Whilst the castle is today ruined, you really do get a clear impression of how hard it would have been to attack because the obstacles just keep coming. Ahead of us, blocking our path was a portcullis, taken from the old French word portcullis, which means sliding gate. This was a thick latticed gate, which disappeared straight upwards into a second floor, common in many castles across the world. You can see the grooves it ran up and down on the walls here. Beyond the portcullis was a double leaf door, one final barrier before we enter the inner bailey. And the man in charge of all of this was the porter, who was based here in the guard room. I absolutely love spaces like this. You can imagine the type of conversations that went on in here. Oh my goodness, have you met the new cook? I know, he's so miserable, isn't he? And have you tried his new soup? It's disgusting. It's like a, a staff room from a modern day office or modern day workplace. It had been full of gossip. The common man would have known this space extremely well. But what of Walter Esbeck and his court, his family? Where did they live? It was of course in the inner bailey. Finally, we've made it into the main living area here at Helmsley Castle. This is where you would have found the kitchen, 
the great hall, the chapel, all the things that the household needed, all the amenities that were required to keep the castle complex working. Now, we've already discovered that this place was built by Walter Esbeck, but what type of a man was he? And why on earth did he build here? When the Normans arrived in England, Helmsley was a small Anglo-Saxon town nestled near a huge forest and surrounded by rich farmland. The land here was so valuable, initially it was given to William the Conqueror's half-brother. In 1088, it ended up back in the hands of the King of England, just as a new star started rising in the royal courts. Walter Esbeck was the son of a friend of William the Conqueror. Although only a minor nobleman, thanks to his father's friendship with King William, he was given the opportunity to work at the royal court, and he made the most of that employment. When the chance arose, he started purchasing plots of land in the north of England. As he rose through the ranks, Walter must have made quite the impression, because he was given the opportunity to buy what was now considered the royal manor of Helmsley. Walter grabbed the opportunity with both hands because Helmsley lay at the geographic centre of the lands he purchased. This was the perfect place to build a castle, which would be Walter's principal residence for the rest of his life. We've made our way into all that remains of the Great Hall. This is one of the original buildings at Helmsley Castle and Walter Esbeck would have known this space incredibly well, or actually stood on the spot where his high table would have sat in the Great Hall during feasts. As we discovered last time, the Great Hall was a space where pretty much everything happened. There was rushes spread on the floor. It's like an early type of carpet, to be honest. It would have given the, you know, a, a sort of bounce as you walked and it would have certainly kept a certain amount of warmth in. There would have been fires in this space as well, keeping everybody warm as they ate. And when the night finished, whilst the Lord would retire to his own rooms, the household would bed down where they'd eaten. So we're walking very much in the footsteps of Walter Esbeck, because when he wasn't eating or entertaining here, he was holding court here. If you committed a crime in medieval England, this is where you were brought to trial. And who sat as judge? The Lord of the Manor. When this castle was first built, that was Walter. But what sort of a man was he? Well, there is a reason that Walter Esbeck rose up the ranks and became Lord of Helmsley. As it transpires, he was a very good man. He was well read, he was well educated, he was a supporter of the arts and a keen supporter of the monastic culture spreading across England. And as Walter became Lord here at Helmsley, it was right at that golden age of the development of the monasteries. And someone who he knew, knew rather well grew to be a friend of his, is a man known today as St Ulred. It was all thanks to this, the nearby Abbey of Revo. Walter had empowered and then supported the growth of what would become one of the most successful monasteries in Europe, and sat at the head of that was Abbot Olred. Now, St Olred was a great writer, and his books are still adored today nearly 900 years after he wrote them, with quotes like, as the result of a kiss, there arises in the mind the wonderful feeling of delight that awakens and binds together the love of them that kiss. You can see why his words are so popular. Walter was effectively Allred's boss. So what did Allred have to say about the man who was lord of all he surveyed and master of these hallowed halls? This is a description of Walter written by Allred, and I think it's pretty special. An old man and full of days, quick-witted, prudent in counsel, moderate in peace, circumspect in war, a true friend and a loyal subject. His stature was passing tall, his limbs all of a size as not to exceed their proportions, and yet to be well matched with his great height. His hair was still black, his beard long and flowing, his forehead wide and noble, his eyes large and bright, his face broad but well featured, his voice like the sound of a trumpet, setting off his natural eloquence of speech with a certain majesty of sound. Walter Esbeck was clearly quite the man. When he arrived here, 
there was just seven households. When he died, Helmsley was on the way to becoming the thriving town that it is today. Because without Walter, without the castle, there would have been no thriving town. And there would have been no Revo Abbey, come to think of it. What a legacy. Walter retired to Revo Abbey in 1154 and he died not long afterward. He had no sons, so the castle passed into his sister's family. For the next 382 years, it passed from one generation to the next. When our story begins in the time of the Tudors, Walter's nieces and nephews had grown his estates into one of the most powerful in England. Gone was the title Lord of Helmsley, in was the much more grand Baron of Helmsley. That though paled against the other title they'd earned, because as Henry VIII set about obtaining his six wives, the owner of Helmsley was Thomas Manners, the first Earl of Rutland. So let's get down to business, shall we? What was life actually like for Tudor people in Tudor England? When we come back in part two, we're gonna to start to uncover their story. And to do that, we're gonna head out into the countryside, into the fields that surround Helmsley. So thank you so much for watching this first part, and I'll see you later on in the show for more England, a castle nation. Start Walter Aspect. Sorry, I said that completely wrong. Aspect. Walter Aspect. I keep doing that because I want to say Aspect. Oh, right. Okay. Walter Aspect with his big booming voice. It makes me think of Aspic. Yeah, I know. Which is like a jelly yeah, type substance. St. Ulred's epic description of Walter. And I've decided I have a new rule. Mm -hmm. If St. Ulred says you're cool, you're all right by me. Absolutely. Isn't he a wise, or wasn't he, I should say, a wise, wise man? <sighs> I mean... Amazing, amazing words and from such a long time ago that are so relevant still. What yeah. stunned me was how close the links were between each of the stories. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, right as Revo is taken off, as we covered last year in The Rise of All the Monasteries, the same thing is happening at Helmsley Castle with a great man sort of at the head of it. Mm. I mean, just brilliant. Mm. What a great mm. start. Absolutely. We've not even I got to the it. Tudor no. intrigue yet. I know, I know. It's all still to come in so, part two. So brilliant. Well done. Well. And sound, everybody. Oh. <laughs> How do you like the sound this time? <laughs> Perfection. What, what was like, when I was editing that, I'm like, oh. This is what it's supposed to be like. Not like before. Whereas I feel like having to pull every possible trick in the book to make it sound like what it did sound yeah. like. Ugh. I think the, the brilliant thing about this one I loved as well was he Helmsley is such an amazing castle that you, you can't, if you're on ground level, you don't get that. No. But then when you see it from up above, you can yeah. really see those yeah. fortifications. Is that the right word? It, yeah, it absolutely is. It's the earthworks. Yeah. The earthworks, that's what makes it. Mm. And it's the same when you go to places. If you went to like a Neolithic. Yes. Like Maiden Castle, for example. We looking mm. at a picture of that the other day. There's a Maiden Castle near here, which we covered in mm. Walking the mm. Dales. And when you go there, you don't understand fully what you're in. You know you're in something cool, but it's only when you get it from above. Mm. And there's some great transitions in part two that you really loved. So that's all to come. I yeah. won't start talking about that yet because it's coming later on the show. Yes. Look, this is exciting because new pattern launch. Yes. So without further ado, I shall ask Kay Jones, what's off your needles? So before I show you the new pattern launch, yes, yes. I'm going to present Dan with his new pair of socks because he's so excited about this pair of socks. 
And I've knit these in a month, exactly a month. I cast them on, I think it was the 10th of February, and I finished them on the 10th of March. Part of me wants to send them to Brock Purdy. I, well, it, I don't think his feet would be this big, no. sadly. I'm sure they wouldn't be. Otherwise, you'd be getting his address. I know. <laughs> Oh, that'd be so cool to do that, yeah, wouldn't it? So, yeah, these are Dan's 49ers socks. Oh, I'm so happy. Look at these. So, it's in, I mean, I, I think it's impossible. And I know you oh, feel, to an extent, you feel the same. I know there'll be some people out there and they'll be thinking, how could you possibly wear 49ers stuff? Because they'll be I thinking, do. they'll be thinking, you know, ex Browns fan, now staunch Detroit Lions fan. Yeah. How could I wear 49ers socks? Well, the reason is because. I was sucked into American football mm. very much through the, the Joe Montana years mm. at the mm. San Francisco 49ers in, into Steve Young. Yeah. There was such a huge part of American football oh, and I the colours and everything about the organisation. I, I, we love the, we still do love the 49ers, yes. you know, and very, we're very much behind Pro, the 49ers. Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy is amazing. He's Christian like a, McCaffrey. He's like, yeah, Christian McCaffrey. Is George like, Kittle. Oh, they're all, there's the list such goes on. amazing players, yes. and I really like where they are. I yeah, like yeah. San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, as a, yeah. I've never a place. been, but I just love Epic you place. know when I've seen it on the telly and stuff. Yeah. I really the love. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love San Francisco as a city, yeah. and I love the colours yeah. of the you know the of the Forty Nine. It's an so, iconic organisation. Yeah. So I, this is a pair. You know, I showed these last time, I think, when I started them, didn't I? But I added in a little stitch pattern, if you can see that there, just to give a bit of interest and to make them go faster. And it absolutely worked. I just to did... To go faster stripe. <laughs> go faster stripe. I did three plain knit rounds and then one round of knit two, pale two. And it just gave me a bit of a target because every day I was doing, I think, something like 16 rounds. Which, you know, if you sit down to do 16 plain rounds, it can be like a bit sluggish, can't it? But four repeats seemed less and it just seemed to fly. Boom. So Thank you so much. This yarn was from Polka Dot Creek. Lovely Shelley. And it was the San Francisco 49ers self-striping set. And it came with the brown, which is football brown. So I actually got two sets because these were 50 gram sets. So you've got 50 grams of the self-striping and 20 grams of the football brown. So I got two sets and I've got just under 20 grams, maybe about 17 grams, something like that, of the self-striping left and... I think there's about 10 grams. I think I used half of each of these of the brown. So I've got plenty to make myself some shorty socks or some mitts. Beautiful. So we'll see what happens with those. I can but wait. These are now, you can wear these Thank now. You. They're all they're washed, blocked. It, they, it washed up beautifully. There was no dye at all in the water. Amazing. Gorgeous to knit. And I will definitely be going back to Shelley's shop for oh. more yarn at some point. I, I can know. wait no longer. Okay. So, yes, pattern launch. So oh. I just published a new design, and I showed you these a couple of episodes back, but they've gone through the testing now, and they're all ready. Well, they're more than ready. They're out they're there. They're released. <laughs> the pattern has been released. So these are my spring shorty socks. Oh, they're gorgeous. Do you remember these ones? Okay. They're lovely, aren't they? Yes. So this yarn I dyed myself, and I just love, you know, because I'm, I'm in this peach obsession still, aren't I? So I still love this yarn. So it's a gorgeous apricotty peach with these dark speckles. And, yeah, the design is like this sort of garter and lace inspired. Well, I say right. lace, it's, it's more an eyelet. It's not a sort of like full-on lace. It's just beautiful. But it's lovely and squishy and cosy. But as you can see, it's a short sock. You can knit it longer if you want to, obviously, and make it a longer sock. But because it's, you know, we're just just about to come into spring. Yeah. So these still feel kind of cosy because of the garter and the squishiness. But they're shorties, so it's like a mixture. Because in spring, it's still inevitably quite cold. It yeah. certainly is in this country. But you can, at early spring, can be quite chilly. Yeah. So they're just the perfect little shorty sock. As you can see, we've got the lovely stitch pattern. 
And then I've done a garter edged slip stitch heel. There's a video tutorial in the pattern for picking up on the garter edge. I've done a square turn and an umbrella toe. So there we go, that pattern is now available on Ravelry and Lovecrafts. So very much inspired by the season. Yes, very much that. inspired by the season. Super quick to knit. Again, it's this combination of a short pattern repeat, interest in it, but then also some nice sort of plainish rows. And it just keeps you going and it just flies off because they are shorty socks as well. Just super quick. You can knock one of these pairs out in a weekend. Kate, I'm being drawn to these. Are you? Do you want to knit them? I'm I'm being drawn in that way, yes. Oh, right. Okay. Well, I'll show what do you, you think? The, I'll show you the stitch pattern. I think you might like them. Yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I right, can feel okay. myself like well, a moth to a flame. I will show you the stitch pattern later and you can decide if you Beautiful. want to. Want to knit them. Beautiful, that's so and exciting. It's, yeah, it's written and charted, the stitch oh. pattern. I always do that you know written written out line by line and charted as well so you've got the option what i love about these socks is how pretty they look they're very very pretty and my testers all of the pairs were super pretty yeah. you know it just came out so lovely yeah. so thank you to my test knitters i really really appreciate the speediness i always when i you know put out a test knit i'm always like quite casual about the date that they need to be finished by i'm usually quite relaxed and everybody was like finished before so that's a great sign yeah yeah really quick especially if you knit a small size so if you are a 56 stitch knitter sock size knitter yeah. you know it's even quicker isn't it do you know what i'm thinking what? i'm thinking these socks with contrasting cuffs heels and toes yes, yeah yes. you could do i've that. never That'd done a contrasting uh, cuff before all oh, right i mean i think that would work really lovely particularly with this because i yes. started off with like a little garter band yes, at yes. the top here Gorgeous. and it really defines the cuff yeah so I think it would look lovely with contrast cuff heel and toe. I'll have to Love it. find you some yarn. Well, I've I still got another sock to knit on that other one. Oh, right. So okay. you're fine. But I think definitely yes. what I like to do with my sock patterns is I like to line them up. Line them up. So I'm not then panicking when I'm finishing off a sock. Look, this is too exciting because we're going to get back to Helmsley Castle and we're yes. going to start to dig into the whole point of this series. Because throughout this series, we're going to be charting the course of the Tudor era and all that came afterwards. And it is the most fascinating story mm. because it shouldn't have happened in the way it did. So let's find out. Let's dig into that Tudor intrigue as we head back to England, a castle nation. England, a castle nation, and we've made our way out into the fields surrounding Helmsley. In 1485, when the Tudor era began, this would have been a busy and vibrant place. So we're going to take a walk through this absolutely gorgeous landscape, and we're going to try and ground ourselves a little bit in the world of Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn, and Elizabeth I. The population of the whole of England at the start of the Tudor period was around two and a half million. 90% of the population lived in places like this out in the country. The rural population was socially organised according to the land they owned. At the top sat the gentleman who normally had a house of six rooms and he owned substantial acres of land. His income came from renting it out and he normally led society and held public office. Far more numerous was the yeomen. They often rented land from gentlemen, though many also owned large portions of land too. The difference was they all worked the land themselves. 
They might hold junior public positions like church warden or maybe even constable of Helmsley Castle. They were in effect prosperous farmers and they lived in four or five bedroom houses. Next came the husbandmen. They were just like yeomen, except on a smaller scale. They lived in two-roomed houses and their life included very few luxuries. Finally came the labourers, who held no land at all. They hired themselves out to their more prosperous neighbours and their diet consisted mainly of bread. Now you'll notice I've not really mentioned any women in that social demographic. You know, don't get me wrong, they were there and they were playing a very important part. It's just their stories weren't very often written down, but through this series, we're going to endeavour to find them. Ninety percent of the people who lived in Helmsley would have known these fields and this surrounding landscape incredibly well. They would have worked in them from sunrise to sunset, and when they weren't here, they would have either have been in their local church going to a service, or perhaps paying homage to their Lord at Helmsley Castle. Now, you've got to imagine that this is a time unlike anything we could possibly consider because there's no social media, there's no 24 hour news. The only news that we would get is from the area directly around us. And whilst it was a much harder existence, when you consider that the only things that would have bothered you was the world directly around you, it sounds like a pretty good life to me, even with all the hardships. Life was not all sunshine and roses though. It was incredibly hard. The work in the fields was difficult. Feeding your family was extremely challenging, especially if there was an issue with the crops. And your world was governed by your local Lord. He was effectively the king in your area. And if he was brutal, you were done for. Your only hope was that the king of England was someone who was leading from the top with a bit of style and a bit of class. But in Tudor England, as 1536 dawned, we were in trouble because the man in charge was perhaps the most infamous of all English kings. It was, of course, Henry VIII. of years being based here in London. This was the focus of the urban population. It was the size of a small modern UK town during Henry's reign with a population of around 75,000 people. Now for us to fully appreciate all that is to follow in this story it's worth noting how Henry VIII became king because this was never supposed to happen. The problem started in 1400, when King Richard II was overthrown by his cousin Henry Bolingbroke. This one act set in motion a chain of events that would lead to what we know today as the Wars of the Roses. This civil war that engulfed all of England was in essence a family squabbling over who should be king. Dastardly deeds were done on both sides, all in an attempt to claim the English crown. After 32 years of intense fighting, the Wars of the Roses were brought to a close by Henry VIII's father, who claimed the Kingdom of England for himself at the Battle of Bosworth. All he needed to do was provide a male heir, and the wars could effectively come to a close forever. This he did, just one year later, with the birth of Arthur, heir to the newly secured throne of England. Arthur was trained completely in the art of kingship. He was married to a beautiful princess, and the future seemed bright until he died of tuberculosis in 1502. Thankfully, there was a backup plan. 
Arthur's brother Henry. Now he was never trained at all in the art of kingship, but he was a tall bright boy who fell completely in love with the princess promised to his brother. He ascended the throne in 1491 with his princess by his side. As the Tudor star ascended, the turmoil of the Wars of the Roses surely were now over. Neil, it is important for me to stress at this point that in those early years, Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon were very much Mr. Darcy and Lizzie Bennet. He was called a rich and virtuous prince by pretty much everyone who he met. He trusted and loved his wife dearly, and he regularly left her in control of the country if ever he had to leave the country on royal business, which was quite often. But at the back of his mind, there was a constant worry. You can see it in the official documents and the history books. Were members of his family plotting? Could at any moment he be deposed and murdered and someone steal his crown? If Henry and Catherine could just produce a strong male heir, so many of those worries would have gone away. But as much as they tried, they couldn't. Only one child survived into adulthood, and that was their daughter, Mary. And so as Henry became older, he grew more cynical. It didn't help that Henry did not take to leadership easily. He was one of the boys. He liked a good time with his friends, and behind closed doors, some might even call him a little childish. This led Henry's eye to stray a little as he got older. And when he met Anne Boleyn, it was thought that that's exactly what would happen again. He'd just have another affair and that'd be the end of it. But Anne really knew what she was doing. And it is a story unto itself. I could make a whole series on the relationship between Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. But needless to say, Anne promised him a son and he was tantalized by that prospect and tantalized by the prospect of being with Anne. But there was only one way he could get it because there was no way the Pope was going to grant him a divorce in the Catholic Church. So the only way Henry could marry Anne Boleyn was by doing something truly abominable, by ridding the country of its whole religion, setting up a new one and putting himself at the head. A new branch of Christianity, which protested against the old ways, was spreading across Europe. Anne was a true believer in this new Protestant approach. With Henry by her side, the old ways, established by men like Walter Esbeck and St. Ored here at Revo Abbey, were swept away. In came the Church of England, and its impact on the population of England was seismic. Suddenly, the rash decisions taken by the king, far away from the fields of Helmsley, were starting to affect everyone. But none of that mattered, because Anne Boleyn was going to provide Henry VIII with a male heir. The Wars of the Roses would be behind us all forever. But the problem was that by 1536, Anne hadn't managed to do that. She'd only produced one surviving child, one heir. That was a daughter, Elizabeth. And so Henry's eye had started to wander again, because Anne's actions had shown Henry a way forward that he'd never considered before. If one wife couldn't give him what he wanted, why not just take another one again? So Henry put his right-hand man, Thomas Cromwell, in charge of the operation to bring down Anne Boleyn. Cromwell arranged for a musician who regularly performed at the King's Court to be arrested and tortured in the Tower of London. His name was Mark Smeaton, and he obviously confessed to whatever he was asked. This including admitting to an affair with the Queen, but also witnessing affairs with the Queen's own brother. The only thing Anne was guilty of was not providing Henry with a son and heir. Henry had no time for a long divorce. He needed a son. So at 8 a.m. on Friday the 19th of May, Anne Boleyn was calm and accepting of her fate. She wore a mantle of ermine over a loose gown of dark grey damask, trimmed with fur and a crimson petticoat as she walked to her execution on Tower Green here at the Tower of London. Before kneeling for the execution itself, she stated, Save my sovereign and master the king, the most godly, noble and gentle prince that is. 
noble words indeed for a lady so poorly treated by her husband. Just 24 hours later, that noble prince married Jane Seymour here at Hampton Court. There followed a whirlwind of activity as the new Queen Jane was introduced to her people. By this point in his life, Henry VIII was surrounded by a trusted group of merry men. Whatever the future may bring, whatever Henry may decide to do with his life, it was their job to support him 110%. And one of those men was a distant relative of Walter Esbeck. His name was Thomas Manners. He was first Earl of Rutland. He'd actually been made that by Henry himself. He was 12th Baron of Helmsley. And one of his homes was, of course, Helmsley Castle. Now I've mentioned the King's Court a few times today in the episode and it's going to be coming up right the way through the series. So what on earth was it? Well in effect it was wherever the King was. Whatever space he was in he was surrounded by a collection of people and those people were the King's Court. So who were they? Who was there? Well there was ambassadors from European countries from all across Europe. There was also though people like the owners of Helmsley. Whilst the villagers who lived in Helmsley answered to the Lord of Helmsley Castle, the Lord of Helmsley answered to the King. Thomas Manners was the owner of Helmsley Castle in 1536. He'd inherited it from his father 23 years before, at just 16 years old. Within about 12 months, he was called to the King's court. And as the king was only about eight years older than him, he very quickly befriended Thomas Manners, the owner of Helmsley Castle. And over the next two decades, a strong friendship developed. Thomas actually spent very little time here. So in his 30 years, being the 12th Baron of Helmsley, he didn't really do very much at all with regards to upgrades. Now don't get me wrong, over the generations a lot had been done to the castle. A lot of new towers and building work had been really done within the boundaries of what had already been established by Walter Esbeck all those hundreds of years before. There was though some pretty serious and substantial upgrades on the horizon. You can see behind me the absolutely spectacular Tudor mansion built in the years following Thomas Manners' death. We'll be exploring that in our second episode. Right now, Thomas Manners has a very important job to do. He's got to introduce the country, the population of England, to their third queen in just three years. But what of England's new queen? Had Henry finally found the right woman? It seems he most certainly had. Everything she did seemed to please him. It does seem that she was a genuinely lovely woman. So much so that she persuaded the king to accept his first daughter Mary, who'd always been seen as a disappointment as an heir. Jane and Mary struck up a wonderful friendship. Bearing in mind Jane was only eight years her senior, this must have been a challenge at first. But they succeeded, and they loved to surprise each other with thoughtful gifts. One in particular stands out. Jane Seymour was a keen gardener, so Mary sent her some cucumbers, which were quite the delicacy in Tudor England. Queen Jane's reputation was not only building bridges at home, but it was also doing so abroad. When the Spanish ambassador met Queen Jane Seymour for the first time, he called her an author and conservator of peace. That's really quite the commendation for someone who had absolutely no experience with foreign relations. If Henry VIII had found his Lizzie Bennet in Catherine of Aragon, he'd found his Jane Bennet in Jane Seymour. And as her meteoric rise 
up the, the echelons of English society took place. It also took her family with her. Her brother was made the Viscount of Beecham. Effectively, if Queen Jane was to produce a male heir, and if anything was to happen to the king before that male heir came of age, it would be her brother who would end up in charge of the country. The Christmas of 1536 was unseasonably cold. So cold, in fact, that the River Thames froze. Usually, there was a big regatta as the king and his court sailed along it to celebrate the twelfth night of Advent. But that year, they had to ride instead. But it was a particularly wondrous event because the new queen was pregnant. King Henry proved himself to be a loyal husband, refusing to be no further than 60 miles from her side throughout the pregnancy. Jane took to her chamber at Hampton Court in the early autumn of 1537. The country was in no doubt that this time it would be a boy. She went into labour on the afternoon of the 9th of October and for two days it lasted, until finally at 2am on the 12th of October a son was born. The history books tell us King Henry wept as he took his son and heir in his arms. At the age of 46, finally he'd done his duty and provided security for his country. His new son was named Edward, after his great-grandfather. Three days after the birth of her child, Queen Jane welcomed guests at Hampton Court Palace, wrapped in velvet and fur. The country went absolutely wild with celebrations. Guns fired, bells rang in churches from dawn till dusk. It was completely insane. The christening itself took place three days later and both the, the king's daughters, Elizabeth and Mary, they both attended. Elizabeth was only four and a half, so she was carried in the procession by Queen Jane's brother. And Mary, who had developed such a strong relationship with Queen Jane, was actually asked to be, and she was absolutely thrilled to be the godmother to the new heir to the English throne and what an absolutely wonderful testament to the friendship that Mary had developed with Jane that she agreed to fulfill that role. But events took a turn for the worst just a day or two later because it very quickly became clear that Queen Jane was not well at all. As it transpired, Jane Seymour had puerperal fever. This was a time long before we understood hygiene and the importance of keeping clean when it comes to things like births. And we had no real understanding of how infections worked either. And if this puerperal fever turned to septicemia, the chances of Jane's survival were slim to none. Now, she fought unbelievably hard but on the 24th of October, it became apparent that she was most probably losing the battle. And by midnight on the 24th, running into the 25th of October, Queen Jane was dead. She was just 28 years old. The country was bereft. Joy turned to desolation. Henry himself would remember Jane for the rest of his life as the perfect queen. Whilst he took to his rooms at Hampton Court, it was Princess Mary who dealt with the news the worst. It's said she went mad with grief. Jane was buried in St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle under the choir on the 12th of November, 1537. Princess Mary, recovered from her initial grief, was chief mourner. Mary led the funeral procession riding a horse that was dressed in velvet trappings and King Henry wore black for the next four months. You can only imagine what the people of Helmsley must have thought about all this drama, excitement, but ultimately, you know, abject sort of disappointment and upset that was going on in London. And they would have got more of a ringside seat than a lot of the other manors in England because of their Lord Thomas Manners' relationship with King Henry. They really would have found out an awful lot of the court gossip. 
And whilst they had to deal with all that, they were also trying to embrace a brand new religion. When I see you next time, we'll walk in the footsteps of the common man as we visit All Saints Church in Helmsley, which now sat at the heart of their new religious community. There we will uncover the story of those early years of the Church of England. We'll also explore the Tudor mansion at Helmsley Castle as we reveal Thomas Manor's integral part in the arrival of King Henry VIII's fourth wife, Anna of Cleves. Because whilst Henry might be grieving in 1537, in 1538, the quest was already on to find him a new bride. How successful would he be? That's what we're going to find out next time. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time for more England, a castle nation. Do you know what? I want to watch the next part. Oh, did you see that? I Tudor? was mad when it ended. I know, I know. Because did, I was like, what? Did you see the Tudor mansion in the background? I did. We've not even been I've in been it. I've been in there. I've been in there. You have, you have. Yeah, yeah. You don't know the, the wonders that await, mm. but also the story just gets, it, that is just the start. Mm. What a fascinating character. Yes, and Helmsley's a lovely place. You were raving about it when you came back. So I, I, we've been, but it was years and years ago. Um, but you were just, it didn't stop talking about it. And I was like, gosh, he wants to move there. I've done. Um, so if you live in Helmsley, you're very lucky. I've done a lot of filming. <laughs> we've done a lot of filming. Mm. And I've never been to a place which was as perfect as that one. You said it had a lovely vibe and everybody you spoke to were just lovely and the whole there's a good variety of shops. The, everything about it was tremendous. Mm. That's the longest I've ever spent there. Cuz mm. we, we've sort of been there for an afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there for the whole day. Yeah. And it was just the most lovely place. Mm. And then when you consider that it's literally just two and a half miles and you're at Revo, mm. Mm. three miles in the other direction, you're at Byland. Pickering is just down the mm. road. It's in a lovely spot, quick to the coast, yeah. easy down to York because you can totally yeah. avoid... The, you don't need to go near to Sutton Bank. It's just a pit... Oh, I don't do Sutton Bank. No. Oh. Well, you can avoid it, though, anyway, because you can drive around underneath and go up through Byland. Right. So you can always avoid it. We've done Sutton Bank a few times. You won't you won't know what I'm talking about if you're not from this country, but it's the steepest, it's scariest steep. Steep. road ever. It is. It is. It's, it's so steep. steep. And I refuse to go up it anymore. <laughs> it's terrifying. I, do you know what? The other thing that I loved about Helmsley was it was such a great place. The castle itself is such a great place to film. It's a pity they don't have a railway station. They would have had one, I'm sure, back in the day. Probably. Yeah. When you go somewhere, you want it to be, you want it to lend itself to what you're trying mm. to do. And sometimes mm. you'll go to a place and it just doesn't. So you have mm. to work quite hard with angles and things. Mm. There at Helmsley, everything was just like lining up great and it's just brilliant. And I'm so excited. It was only through the final two episodes of the last series that mm. we sort of discovered this two-episode approach to these sites. It's so important because you just can't dig into no. the real stories. So going back there, a second episode, I'm so excited about it. Mm. And the story just gets bigger and better. But next time... Excellent, can't wait. Kay is, of course, back with the next Yarny Book Club. Yes, indeed. Which I'm so excited about. I'm loving this series, specifically yeah. for your Reading Corner reviews. Yes, well, this what this next one is really interesting because I've chosen a book that I've literally just read. And, I, I, you know, I, I enjoyed it so much that yeah, I, I just it. thought... Why not? You know, it doesn't Quite always right. doesn't always have to be a book that's much loved and you've Current known, is known great. for years and and what have you. Yeah, so I've literally just just finished this book and I just absolutely loved it. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna that's the one I'm gonna choose. Excellent. Yeah, so it's gonna be interesting. Look, that's enough because it's time for some very cool Endy bits. Endy bits. Oh yes. 
I'm seeing yarn over here and I'm getting very excited about it. I bought a little bit of yarn, yeah. The first I mentioned briefly when I was talking about the fairground socks, I, I bought another skein from Fab Funky Fibres, which is a UK-based shop. And as I said, I used her yarn for the fairground socks. And because Bryony mentioned it to me, I said to her, do you know what, I'll go and have a look in her shop and see what she's got right now. And I saw this skein, because what Bryony liked on those was that it's got, the one that I used has, um, some of the stripes are like black and white, and then it's got different colours, and she really liked that. And I found this skein, which was a similar sort of thing. It's got black in it, but then it's pastel colours. And when I saw the name of this colourway, I was like, I have got to get that for Bryony. There is no two ways about it. So these come in 50 gram skeins, so I've got two. And it's called, I'll show you the yarn, and you can see actually the name of it. But it's called Space, The Final Frontier. That's amazing. So it will make sense to you why I had to get this for Bryony, because she loves Star Trek. She's a huge, huge fan. Those colours do give me a sort of late 60s vibe yeah, as well. Yeah, I think they do. And the label is so cool. It's a print of the Star Trek characters. And I think it's got like original Pike on it. I don't know. Is that original Pike there? I'm not sure. I didn't realise that the plan was when they started that series, yeah. for him to be the captain. Oh, really? Right. And there was an issue with... There was something to do with the actor's wife. Right. She was really... I, I, she was involved with the, the agent side of things. Oh, and she right. was really difficult to deal with. So they wrote him out. Oh, gosh. So Pike was going to be the captain. Right. Kirk was not. Oh, Crazy. So, yeah, this yarn is made up of... There's a black, but then we've got lemon, we've got mint lilac pink and white Lovely. and i was sent a mini of the lilac oh. and i'm sure this didn't come with it oh, so i think that was a gift as well so i was absolutely thrilled to get that because i was thinking when i saw this oh i'll have to go through my stash and try and find a color that will match i don't need to because i was sent the lilac so that was brilliant and she's just up the road from us as well so excellent and then i made quite a considered purchase and this is all the fault of our lovely knitability editor jen jen and review presenter blaming you for this purchase <laughs> um yeah because she did a review of this yarn and i watched it and i was like oh that looks really nice <laughs> i'm gonna go and have a look at the shop and at the time they were just about to do this update where I can't remember the name of the update, but it was basically like one of a kinds. It was the gorgeous yarn um, update. <laughs> yeah, it, it was just, they were all one of a kinds. They didn't have names. It's, it's where they'd been sort of working through processes for coming up with new colourways. And then they'd ended up with these skeins, which weren't the finished colourway. So they were sort of made one of a kind. And I was like, oh, do you know what? I'm going to try and grab a few of those. So the... That's my favourite. This one, yeah, yeah. The dyer is three by the sea designs. I think it's gorgeous. And I'm sure you will all know this dyer. They are based in Tampa Bay, everybody. We'd very much also like the Buccaneers. <laughs> so Tampa Bay in Florida. And you can see this one. They just all say salty sock set. And I think that's their way of saying it. They're sort of one of a kind. Sadly, the Tom Brady era is over, though. Tom Brady era is over. And the Baker I mean, Mayfield era has arrived. Yeah, we're not fans of Baker Mayfield. <laughs> he's a perfectly pleasant chap, but I don't think he's going to lead them to the promised land. If I, don't, <laughs> I don't think he is. But what I love about the Buccaneers is I love the ship that's in the stadium. It's so cool. And the creamsicle outfits. And the creamsicle outfits. Yes, yes. bring it oh, back. Oh, that, that sort of orangey colour. And I've got a top that's in that orangey colour. I remember the days when Steve top. Young used to wear that outfit. That's the coolest strip yes, ever. Yes, really and they is. need to wear it more. I love yeah. it. But I love the pirate ship and I love that they, when they got touchdowns, they fire put, the cannons. Fire the cannons. Yes. I love all that vibe. Yes, I think it's, cool. it's brilliant. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I decided to pick up a few of these skeins. So the first one is, as I've showed you, this gorgeous purpley, pinky loveliness with a pink mini. I mean, that's just beautiful isn't it jen yes. jen you're going to be loving this one aren't you <laughs> yes, she very she much likes pink like me yes and then so that's 
I thought all of these were the same base, right? Because they all said 75, 25. So I just presumed they were all the same base. But two of them are not the same base. So the one I've just showed you is the standard 75, 25. You get 463 yards. They call it Sanibel, the base. I don't know what all these words mean. It must be something to do with Florida, I feel. But the other two are not the same base. These two also say fingering weight and they also say 75, 25. So when I purchased them, I just presumed they were all the same. However, I didn't look enough when I purchased them because it, there was a shot of the back of the sock set and it does show the yardage. It's a lesser yardage, it's 415 yards. So it's plumper then? So it's much plumper. Yeah, yeah. It, to me, it's a very heavy fingering, yeah. if not virgin on sport weight. But they're they're both super pretty. So I got this one. Good but the, the mini yeah. is in the other base, the right. Sunny Bell, Bell base, and this one is the thicker. Right. It's very much thicker. I don't know if it's coming off. You can see here to here. Yeah. So. Either, so I got this lovely green set and then I also got purple with pink. Again, Jen, Jen's going to be loving this. And the colours are just gorgeous. So I, th I was pondering over what I'm going to do with this because I was like, oh, you know, I just think that might be a bit thick for like the standard stitch count that I do. So I'm going to wind one of them and have a ponder. And I think if I think it's too thick for a two and a half millimetre needle, I mean, it might be that it's all right on two and a half millimetre. You know, it might be totally fine. It might be that the yarn is sort of poofy, but when you knit it, it might be okay. But I could always use a lower stitch count. So I could do 60 stitches. Or even, if I think it's super plump, I could go up a needle size to 2.75 maybe and do 56 stitches. So I'm kind of looking forward to just experimenting with these ones and just seeing how they come out. Because if I could do a 56 stitch sock that would fit me, then this would make a really quick, beautiful pair of shorty socks. So I'm going to do a bit of pondering over that. But the colours are absolutely gorgeous, I've got to say. The dyeing looks lovely. And I think they're just about to do a spring update and the colours for that are beautiful as well. So uh, gorgeously dyed yarn and the, the people all there seem super, super lovely. Cool. Our radio show is back next week and yes. we're talking about Yorkshire. We ah. were both born there. But yes. what is it that makes it so special? Different bits. You were born in North Yorkshire, I was born in South Yorkshire. Yes, yes. Yeah. So what makes Yorkshire so special? Is it the accents? Is it the phrases? Mm. Is it the amazing locations? Yeah. We're going to be talking about all of this in our next radio show, which will be out next Friday. You might get some very dodgy accents oh, from definitely. me. In, 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 we shall insist upon that. <laughs> yes, she will be doing Posey and Pirtle. No, they're not from yours. No, I know. I'm only joking. Our favourite places to knit series is back. Our favourite place to knit revisited. Every month we publish one yep. of our original favourite places to knit. This one is from 2015 that I've just finished, in, finished editing. It's filmed at Aysgar Falls. Yeah. And it's just the, the most cool episode because we're exploring... It's nine years ago. Yes, yes. We're exploring the Robin Hood links yes. to Aysgar Falls. Yes. So there's little bits of Sycamore Gap references. Mm -hmm. There's also... We take a look at the fight scene where he fights with Little John... And it's just a really cool trip mm. from a long time mm. ago. So I've worked my magic, got rid of the wobbly camera, <laughs> improved it with some new footage as well, put in some new music, and that will be coming out next week. Also as well, Kay's back very soon with an episode of her design diary where mm. you're going to be sharing the story of the spring shorties. Mm. Which is spring going to be shorty cool. socks that we spoke about, yeah. And Jen will also be here, and you as well. You, you've both done new reviews which are coming soon as well. Yeah. Jen yeah. will be tempting you with more yarn. Oh, I know. Tempting you into a new purchase. Jen, I can't yes. even bear it. She keeps showing all these beautiful yarns yes. and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> can't watch so folks that is it from us this time thank you so much for watching thanks everybody and we'll see you in two weeks with another episode of the Yarny Book Club yes. we'll see you then see you soon bye bye sitting and knitting enthusiasm's not quitting they'll take you to fabulous places of which they're Self and
the castle we're watching the paper repairs It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the paper repairs What's on your shelf for once in